Thank you. That concludes general questions. The next item of business is First Minister's questions, and I call Douglas Ross. Thank you, Presiding Officer. 67-year-old Esther Brown was raped and murdered by Jason Graham. This is a man who was a registered sex offender and had 23 previous convictions. In 2013, he was given a seven and a half year sentence for the rape of a retired nurse, but he got released early on licence. After Graham was sentenced yesterday for this brutal attack and murder, one of Esther's friends said she was the type of person that would go and help anybody. First Minister, can you honestly say that your government's approach to justice is keeping the people of Scotland safe? First Minister. Well, firstly, and uh, most importantly, Presiding Officer, can I uh, say that my thoughts and my sympathies are with Esther Brown's family and with her friends. Uh, absolutely nothing, uh, including nothing I or anyone else in this chamber can say will ease the pain uh, that that family is suffering um, or uh, ease the pain of anyone uh, who knew her. Uh, I do hope that the closure um, of the sentence uh, yesterday uh, will bring uh, some uh, closure to the family, but I do not underestimate uh, the pain that they will uh, be suffering and will continue to suffer for some time. Obviously, I uh, cannot comment on the detail of all individual cases. I think it is important, firstly, to recognise that in this case there will be a significant case review that will assess the circumstances of the protection arrangements which were in place and the roles of the operational agencies involved. Uh, and it will have a very clear view to learning any lessons. And it is right and proper, and indeed I would say it is essential that lessons uh, are learned and acted upon as appropriate. In terms of automatic early release, of course, this is an issue of contention, has been for many years in this Parliament. Uh, this government legislated uh, back in 2016 uh, to end the previous system of automatic release for prisoners. Uh, and that could not, of course, be retrospective uh, legislation, but I think it was an important uh, move to make. Uh, we will continue to ensure that our justice system uh, does protect uh, people from uh, criminals, that does ensure that victims get the justice they deserve, but also a justice system that tries to ensure that the principles, and I'm not talking about this case uh, when I make this uh, point, that the principles of rehabilitation and reducing reoffending are also at its heart. Douglas Ross. This case, though, is just yet another damning example of the glaring flaws in Scotland's justice system. Jason Graham was released early. He wasn't monitored properly. Yesterday, he got 19 years. Yes, a long sentence, but not nearly enough for such a horrific crime. This week, the Scottish Government launched a consultation proposing that violent criminals could get out after just six or seven years. Their document suggests long-term prisoners could be considered for release after just a third of their sentence. Doesn't the First Minister see that these proposals would take our justice system even further in the wrong direction, risking public safety? First Minister. There are very serious issues here. I think perhaps before I come on to the issues of early release and indeed the consultation that was published uh, by the government in recent days, it is important uh, to say uh, that there are processes and procedures in place which clearly uh, did not work in this particular tragic case, uh, but there are processes in place through the multi-agency public protection arrangements to minimise uh, risks posed by registered sex offenders. Um, and as I said earlier on, in uh, cases like this, it is right that there is a significant case review to ensure that any appropriate lessons are learned. On the issue of automatic early release, uh, my government didn't introduce the previous arrangements, but we did legislate to end those arrangements. Uh, it is important that we recognise uh, that it is necessary to have in place a justice system that punishes those who deserve to be punished, and that is always an important principle of the justice system, but that also uh, promotes rehabilitation and tries to reduce reoffending. Uh, one of the things that is often lost in these discussions, and of course I, I want to continue to reiterate, I'm talking uh, in general terms here, not about the, the case of Esther Brown, uh, but in Scotland uh, we imprison a higher proportion of our population than any other country in Western Europe. So it's not that we don't send a lot of people to prison. 
The question is, uh, is prison always uh, the effective uh, punishment uh, for people? It will be in many, many cases. Uh, we want to have a system of release from prison that has, firstly, risk assessment and victim safety at its heart, and that also uh, looks at what is most effective to reduce reoffending. The consultation that was published uh, this week is a consultation, and I would encourage people across the Chamber and indeed the wider public to respond to that consultation. Um, it is uh, important to say, and this will be my last point, Presiding Officer, uh, in this answer, uh, the abolition of automatic early release for the most dangerous long-term prisoners is not affected by any of the consultation proposals that were published earlier this week. The First Minister started her answer by saying there are processes and procedures in place. Those processes and procedures didn't save Esther Brown from being raped and being murdered. So I'm sorry, that does not cut it when we are dealing with lives being lost and it is not an individual case. The SNP government consultation doesn't stop there, however. It also proposes automatically releasing short-term prisoners after just a third of their sentence. The First Minister previously told this chamber, and I quote, our objective remains to end the policy of automatic early release completely as early as we are able to. That was six years ago. Yet now, far from keeping dangerous criminals off our streets, this government is proposing to let them out even earlier. First Minister, isn't it the case that this government's course of action has let some of the worst offenders back onto our streets free to commit further offences? First Minister. Firstly, Presiding Officer, and the record will bear this out here, I said in my previous answer uh, that the arrangements that are in place uh, through the multi-agency public protection uh, scheme uh, to protect people from registered sex offenders clearly did not work as intended in the case of Esther Brown. Um, and I know that nothing I can say in terms of uh, the generality of these issues uh, will bring any comfort uh, to her family. And I want to, to make that clear again. I have also been at pains to say that some of the comments I am making, uh, because clearly there are wider issues here that Douglas Ross is right to raise, um, I appreciate uh, are not applicable to the specifics of uh, Esther Brown's uh, case. So I, I, I want to be clear again there. I absolutely understand that any, anybody who loved her uh, listening to me right now will take no comfort whatsoever in anything I say. But the government has a duty to ensure that the overall justice system has the right principles at heart when things go wrong, that lessons are learned, and that is what we will always seek to do. In terms of automatic early release, this government did legislate to end uh, automatic early release for uh, certain categories of uh, prisoner, for those serving sentences of four years or more. I, I don't want to uh, get into uh, politics in such a serious issue. The, the Conservatives, though, didn't vote for those reforms at that time. Other parties across this chamber uh, did. Um, and it is important that as we move forward, we continue to keep all of these arrangements under review. The consultation published this week is a consultation. It does seek views on whether certain prisoners serving short-term sentences uh, could be released earlier than halfway if and this is the important if, this was felt to better support their successful reintegration into society and therefore help to reduce the risks of reoffending. Uh, we look forward to hearing responses to that consultation and we will consider all of them carefully. Um, rates of crime, uh, and I appreciate again for any victim of crime, this is no comfort at all, rates of crime are at their lowest level in many years uh, in Scotland um, and we send a higher proportion of our population to prison than any other country in Western Europe. Uh, so we have to ask ourselves, is how we use prison the most effective it could be um, and therefore it is right that we consider these things carefully and we will uh, certainly do so. And as we do that, of course, we will learn lessons uh, from tragic cases uh, like the one we are discussing today. Dr. Shoffs. More dangerous offenders like Jason Graham are being released early all the time. The most recent annual figures show that over 95% of criminals sent to prison in Scotland will be eligible for automatic early release. Over 95%. Far too often in the SNP's soft touch justice system, criminals are put first, not victims. Absolutely. It's too late for Esther Brown, but this must change. Our victims' law would restore confidence that is sadly lacking. This government has a choice to make empty our prisons by letting even more criminals out early, or protect the public 
and put victims first. I choose public safety and supporting victims. Which side is the First Minister on? First Minister, we should all be on the side of uh, victims of crime, but we should also all be on the side of trying to make Scotland as a whole safer. And that does mean uh, trying to make sure that we have a penal system in place that, yes, punishes, and that is a, an important, vital principle of any justice system, but that also helps us reduce the risk of those uh, who do serve uh, sentences in prison from re-offending. And that is uh, the wider issue that we have a responsibility to consider. Um, I know it is an easy soundbite for the Conservatives, but to describe a country as soft touch uh, justice uh, when we both have some of the lowest uh, crime rates uh, that we've had in many years, but also, as I've said already today, send a higher proportion of our population to prison uh, than any other country in Western Europe is simply not accurate. The question we have to ask ourselves is our justice system uh, and the approaches that are taken to dealing with offenders always as effective as they should be, uh, both in punishing but also in reducing re-offending. Uh, and that presents difficult, challenging, uh, at times very contentious issues. I accept that, which is why we are consulting carefully on these proposed reforms and we will listen carefully to all of the responses that we receive. Question number two, Anna Sarwar. Presenting officer, I have repeatedly come to this chamber to raise tragedy after tragedy at the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital. Despite that, we still have a culture of cover-up, denial and families being failed. Everyone should read the heartbreaking words from Louise Lawrence, the widow of Andrew Lawrence, who died in December after being treated at the hospital for cancer. Andrew was the First Minister's official spokesperson in 2007 and then head of the Scottish Government's Response and Communication Unit. He was at the heart of the COVID pandemic response. Andrew went into the hospital to get treatment that would prolong his life. Instead, in hospital, he contracted COVID and then a fungal infection, Aspergillus, a deadly bacteria often linked to water or mould. He died just days later. His wife, Louise, told me that she was never informed about the fungal infection and she had to uncover it in his medical notes after his death. She has courageously spoken of her anger, her shock, her distress, and her disappointment. Why? Why, despite everything that has happened, do we still have a culture of cover-up, secrecy and denial, with families being forced to take on the system to get the truth? First Minister. Uh, Presiding officer, first of all, um, I can assure the Chamber that I have read Louise's words uh, very closely. Um, firstly, because I will always uh, do that uh, when uh, relatives of those who have uh, died or received substandard care in our National Health Service speak out. Um, that is part of my duty. But in this case, obviously, I have done that uh, because Andrew was someone I knew uh, very well. Andrew was a greatly valued member of the Scottish Government team. Uh, he is deeply missed by everyone uh, who had the privilege of working with him, and that certainly includes me. I think I first met Andrew on the very first day uh, I served in government back in 2007. He made an exceptional contribution to the Scottish Government's work, and my thoughts are with my thoughts are often with his loved ones, in particular his uh, wife Louise and his children. Um, we will be engaging, in fact, uh, my officials have engaged already this morning with Greater Glasgow and Clyde Health Board so that the concerns that have been raised are properly investigated. Uh, we will do everything uh, possible to ensure that Andrew's family get the answers uh, that they are seeking and also consider very carefully uh, whether the concerns that have been raised uh, by Louise Lawrence uh, have uh, wider or raise wider issues that require to be addressed. Uh, the Chief Operating Officer of NHS Scotland has contacted uh, Greater Glasgow and Clyde uh, this morning to start to establish the facts and uh, I have asked for information to be available later today and then we will assess what further steps require to be taken. Um, I will not, uh, and this government will not tolerate cover-ups uh, or secrecy on the part of any health board uh, and where there are concerns about that we will address those concerns and of course in uh, relation to the Queen Elizabeth Hospital uh, and other issues uh, raised uh, including of course by Anna Sarwar over the years about Queen Elizabeth Hospital there is underway right now uh, a public inquiry and I think that I hope that is a sign of our determination to ensure that any issues that are raised uh, are properly investigated and that answers are forthcoming. Um, and I uh, am determined, and the government is determined, that that will be the case in relation to Andrew's death as well. Anna Sarwar. Presenting officer, say, uh, sorry, the First Minister says she's heard these concerns from me for years. So why is it still happening? If even the widow of Andrew Lawrence 
can't get the truth and justice he deserves when he was at the heart of this government, what chance does anybody else in our country have? Because this is a repeated pattern. Think of the case and the scandal at the Children's Cancer Ward that led to the tragic death of Millie Main. In that case, a bacteria linked to water, Stenotrophomonas, was identified by infection control doctors, ignored by management and covered up. In this case, a bacteria linked to water and mould, Aspergillus, was identified by infection control doctors, ignored by management and covered up. That is the culture of secrecy and denial, and the government can escape that fact. And again, these cover-ups have deadly consequences. So will the First Minister agree to Louise's demands? Firstly, an independent case note review into all Aspergillus cases at the hospital. Secondly, an independent Crown Office-led investigation into hospital-acquired COVID infections. And thirdly, for the public inquiry remit to be expanded to include Aspergillus cases. But crucially, the health board leadership have lost the confidence of clinicians, patients, parents and the public. Given everything that has already happened, and everything that has already been uncovered, why is this health board leadership in Glasgow still in place? First Minister. Uh, I'm going to continue to address uh, the issues uh, raised. I said in my uh, initial answer that my officials have engaged with the health board uh, already today. Uh, I have asked for further information later today when I have had the opportunity uh, to look at and assess that. Uh, we will consider, I will consider um, with the health secretary what uh, additional steps are required. Um, I note uh, Louise has uh, requested uh, a case note review and that of course uh, was something uh, that uh, was done in the earlier issues uh, in relation to the Queen Elizabeth so I think that is a reasonable request obviously I will uh, consider uh, that with the Health Secretary later on. On the other two uh, issues uh, that Louise Lawrence has requested I absolutely understand uh, why uh, that is the case but as I know Anna Sarwar is aware the Crown Office is independent of Ministers. The Crown Office can look into any cases it deems appropriate. It is not appropriate for me as First Minister to instruct the Crown Office uh, in these matters. Similarly with the public inquiry, the public inquiry is operating independently of ministers, rightly and, and properly. It is able to look at any issues associated with the Queen Elizabeth that it considers appropriate. But again, it would, and to be uh, beyond any doubt, uh, there is uh, certainly no objection on the part of the government to uh, the public inquiry looking into any of the issues that have been really, uh, raised in relation to Andrew Lawrence uh, by his wife today. But it is not for me to instruct the public inquiry because it is operating independently of ministers uh, and it will take the decisions as to what issues it chooses to look at. Anna Sarwar. I accept what the First Minister says, but I note she dodged the question altogether about the leadership of the Health Board uh, in Glasgow. Uh, but I'm sorry, the answer is not good enough, uh, because this has been raised for years, as the First Minister herself noted. The right thing to do would not be to ask an official to make contact with the leadership of the Health Board and have a process that comes back. The right thing to do would be the First Minister to grip this issue, take ownership of it, and get it sorted out. Because, presiding officer, despite the tragic loss of life, despite the cover-ups and despite the denials, not a single person has been held accountable for the catastrophic errors at this hospital. This cannot continue. From start to finish, the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital scandal has happened under Nicola Sturgeon's watch. She was health secretary when the hospital was commissioned and built. She was first minister when it was opened. And since then, water reports ignored, deadly building flaws, patients getting infections, wards closed, patient deaths, staff bullied and silenced, an independent review, a case note review, a public inquiry, criminal investigations, continued failings, continued cover-ups, and families still having to go public to fight the system to get the truth. Enough is enough. This is the worst scandal of the devolution era. And in any other country in the world, there will be resignations and sackings. But under this government, it's denial and cover-up. How many more families have to lose loved ones before anyone is held to account. First Minister. There is, there is right now an independent statutory public inquiry underway, and I think that is right and proper. It was instructed by this government, by the previous Health Secretary. If I was to start, or if this government was to start to preempt the outcomes of that public inquiry, then I think with some justification, uh, Anna Sarwar and perhaps others uh, would say that was wrong as well, because we were seeking to interfere with uh, the work that that inquiry was doing. These are serious issues. I think they deserve to be treated seriously. 
and on the substance of the issues. Uh, the public inquiry is doing that work right now, um, and the, the findings uh, and any recommendations that flow from that public inquiry absolutely uh, should be, uh, must be, and will be acted upon. But I think it is incumbent on all of us uh, who care about these issues, and I know that includes all of us uh, in this chamber, to allow that public inquiry to do its work. Thank you. Move to supplementary questions, and I call Claire Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The First Minister may be aware that Wisha based family owned Weir and McQuiston Scotland Limited entered administration this week. WMQ was one of Scotland's leading mechanical and electrical contractors, and this is devastating development for the owners and the 90 members of staff affected. Can I ask what engagement the Scottish Government has had with the administrators through PACE and what support has been put in place for the people affected by these job losses in my constituency? First Minister. Well, I thank Claire Adamson uh, for raising what I know is an important constituency issue uh, for her. I was uh, very sorry also to hear that Weir and McQuiston had ceased trading after such a long period of time, uh, some 45 years of training. And my thoughts are with the employees uh, affected by that decision and their families. Uh, I can assure Claire Adamson that our local PACE team has already uh, been in touch with the administrators. They are working closely uh, with the Redundancy Payments Office, uh, who will ensure that information on PACE support is issued to the affected employees. And we stand ready uh, to do anything uh, reasonable that we can to support them at this very difficult time. Brian Whittle. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I have a constituent who is in the vulnerable category and went to book their booster vaccination and was told availability is not until mid-January. Um, I have this confirmed by Ayrshire and Health Board that they are uh, completely full. Uh, with that in mind, does the Government have any plans to expand the booster vaccination scheme to ensure that those who should get a booster have access to that booster? First Minister. Uh, yeah, yes, we do. I'm happy to look into that particular case and to uh, the, the wider issue in Ayrshire and Arran. Uh, we have plans in place uh, and are working uh, to ensure that those who are eligible and Remember, eligibility for the booster means six months on from uh, the second dose, that all of those who are eligible are vaccinated as quickly as possible um, and uh, before the end of this year, uh, wherever possible. So that is uh, how we have uh, designed the system. We are flexing the system. Just this week, of course, we are seeking uh, to increase capacity further to start vaccinating those in the over 40 age group. Um, so people should be getting appointments uh, quickly, uh, and uh, I will certainly look into any uh, situation where somebody has been told, if they are eligible, if they have already passed the six months, uh, that it will be January. And if there is not uh, a good reason for that, we will certainly take that up with the Ayrshire and Arran Health Board. Paul Sweeney. Thank you, Presiding Officer. COP26 delegates were handed a free smart card like this one to access integrated public transport across the central belt of Scotland. But my constituent, who was cleaning toilets for the world leaders at the SEC in Glasgow, had to pay £5 for a bus ticket and another £3 for the subway every day compared to £3 on publicly controlled transport for London services or £3.60 on publicly controlled and owned Lothian buses services. So in Glasgow, on minimum wage, an hour's pay each day is spent paying to get to and from work. Does the First Minister therefore agree that a Green New Deal for workers in Glasgow must include using the powers of the 2019 Transport Act to bring all public transport in Greater Glasgow under a single integrated publicly controlled franchise with London-style capped fares? First Minister. Well, I think there's, there's two related issues there, and I certainly agree with the sentiment behind the question. Uh, on the integration uh, of ticketing, Transport Scotland is already working towards all journeys on our public transport networks being able to be made using some form of smart ticketing or payment, and progress has already been made uh, towards that objective. Uh, the second issue is affordability, and uh, I do think it is an important part uh, of our journey to net zero and getting uh, more people to use public transport to make uh, public transport much more affordable uh, and therefore more accessible. Uh, we need to uh, do that uh, in a way that we can accommodate it within our budgets, and we are uh, looking at uh, that right now, of course, in the context of our budget process. But during uh, COP, of course, one of the things we were able to confirm uh, was the introduction of free bus travel for all those under uh, 22, which will come into force at the very start of next year. Uh, we need to go further than that, and uh, we are looking at uh, how quickly um, we can do that within the resources available to us. But making sure public transport is more accessible, both in affordability terms, uh, but also in the ease of using it, is a key priority for us. Emma Harper. 
to ask the First Minister if she will join me in thanking all the staff, volunteers and people of Scotland who have helped make Scotland the first UK nation to give the extra vaccine dose to half of over 50s. And I remind Chamber that I am still part of NHS DNG's vaccine team. First Minister. Uh, yeah, I would want to take the opportunity to again thank everybody uh, who is working really hard to design uh, the vaccination programme uh, to do all of the uh, work to work out how uh, we get the capacity where that capacity should be and of course those who are administering the vaccines in vaccine centres the length and breadth of the country and I know that does include uh, Emma Harper. Uh, the programme is going very well. Uh, we have become the first part of the UK to pass 50 per cent of uh, over 50s being vaccinated with the booster but there is still a long way to go. Vaccination remains our best line of defence against this virus so let me take the opportunity briefly, uh, Presiding Officer, to encourage anybody who is not yet vaccinated with either the first, second or if they're eligible for their booster, please get vaccinated because you're protecting yourself and others. Uh, so please do it without delay. Douglas Lumsden. Thank you, Presiding Officer. On Tuesday, the First Minister turned her back on 100,000 oil and gas jobs, many in the North East. Yesterday, the SNP turned its back on its commitment to fully duel the A96. Can the First Minister explain to the people of the North East why she has turned her back on them. First Minister. Well, like much else that comes from the Conservative benches, that is just complete nonsense, but also completely ignores the, the responsibility all of us have uh, to address climate change. Yeah. Um, these issues are complex, they are difficult, they are often contentious. Um, but on the issue of oil and gas, let's firstly be clear on this. The transition away from oil and gas, which the science says is essential, uh, must be a just one. It mustn't put 100,000 workers into unemployment or increase reliance on imports. But the question that then flows from that is the key question. Uh, do we say, because we've got a current uh, jobs and energy reliance on oil and gas, that we continue to go on uh, with new developments uh, and unlimited extraction? Or do we say we need to break that cycle of reliance by investing in the alternatives and speeding up our move away from fossil fuels. I think our obligation to the planet says that we need to do the latter. That's why this government is investing in a just transition, uh, but that is a just transition uh, that would be easier if the Conservative UK government hadn't turned its back on carbon capture and storage, the Scottish cluster and the ACORN project. So perhaps that's something that the Conservatives want to take up with their colleagues in London. Paul King. Presiding officer, the heartbroken family of Andrew Florence are not the only family seeking answers about what happens to loved ones at the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital. Chisa Smith, as reported on the front page of the Greenock Telegraph today, has spoken of the deep pain her family has endured since the death of her daughter Sophia in April 2017 at just 12 days old. Sophia died of an infection contracted at the Queen Elizabeth, despite initially responding well to treatment for breathing problems. The family were not informed and had to fight for a post-mortem to know the truth. Teresa and her family have described the tortuous journey to try and get answers on what happened with phone calls, emails and letters stonewalled, and she too has pointed to a cover-up. I have heard what the First Minister said in response to Anna Sarwar about the public inquiry, but does she, don't, does she not recognise that it didn't save Andrew Florence, and it won't save patients right now. What is the government doing immediately to prevent these terrible and tragic deaths from happening again? First Minister. Infection, infection prevention control is a, a, a priority within every hospital all of the time, and that is absolutely right and proper. So is uh, the need to learn lessons uh, for where, th from when things uh, go wrong, uh, and uh, that is a daily priority of health boards and hospitals across the country. Uh, I want to convey my sympathies also to, to Sophia's family. Um, if the member uh, wants to correspond with me, I am uh, very uh, willing to see if there is uh, something the government can do to help get answers that Sophia's family understandably want. But in a situation like this, uh, it is right, uh, and, and indeed it was called for, that we have a proper, independent, statutory public inquiry. That is not the sign of a government trying to cover things up. That is the sign of the opposite. That is the sign of a government determined to get to the truth, determined to find the facts, determined to get the answers, and determined to learn the lessons. And that is what we should be seeing. Question number three, Co-Cab Stewart. 
to ask the First Minister uh, what the Scottish Government anticipates the lasting impact of COP26 will be for the people of Glasgow and Scotland. First Minister. Um, I think the lasting impact will be a very positive one. Um, I think we can all feel pride in the leadership that Scotland and uh, the people of Scotland and in particular the people of Glasgow have shown during COP. I think the outcome, uh, while not going as far as many of us would have liked it uh, to go, will accelerate or help accelerate our delivery to net zero and it's important that people and communities are at the heart of that. Uh, we're currently funding a number of projects in Glasgow through the Climate Challenge Fund, supporting uh, communities to reduce uh, car Alliance, cut waste, grow local food and lower energy use. Um, and we're also building a new model to support further community climate action, uh, which I think will be part of the longer term legacy from COP in Glasgow over the past two weeks. Co-Cap Stewart. Thank you. Um, for many countries in the global south, the impacts of climate change are already being felt. We have a moral responsibility to acknowledge this and to take action. The Scottish Government has led the way by providing £2 million funding for loss and damage, a commitment that has been widely welcomed, including by the United Secretary General Antonio Guterres, but we cannot act alone. So can I ask the First Minister, how will the Scottish Government continue to push for climate justice globally post COP26? First Minister. Uh, well, firstly, we will... Uh try to lead by example through our actions at home. That is why uh, the decisions we've taken to increase our climate justice fund uh, are important and why uh, our decision to allocate resources uh, to the issue of loss and damage uh, is important because it allows us then to use that leadership to seek to encourage others to do likewise. Uh, I've already had discussions on this issue uh, with other governments. I know there is a willingness uh, now to step forward on loss and damage and we will uh, continue to try to play our part in building that momentum. It's really important that we focus on actions to mitigate climate change, to help countries adapt to the future impacts of climate change. Uh, but as Kokab Stewart rightly says, there are many countries across the world uh, that are suffering loss and damage right now. They are struggling to cope with that. And the developed world, which of course uh, has done the most to cause climate change, has a real moral obligation to step up and play our part in helping with that. And Scotland will continue uh, to do everything we can to play our full part. Neil Bibby. As my colleague Paul Sweeney has already said, one of the positives from the uh, COP conference in Glasgow was that delegates benefited from smart integrated ticketing, something the First Minister actually promised Scotland almost a decade ago, but has never delivered. Dublin this week is rolling out a new 90-minute ticket across bus, tram and train. Glasgow and Scotland is falling further behind our neighbours. So when will the First Minister finally make seamless and affordable, affordable public transport a reality for Scotland's passengers? First Minister. Uh, that work is already underway. I'm not going to repeat uh, everything I said in response to the previous question on this. It is a, an important question. It's an important priority. But let me uh, repeat one point. From uh, January next year, every young person under the age of 22 will have free bus travel uh, in Scotland. That is a significant step forward. It's not the end of the journey. We've got to build on that to go further. But we are taking concrete steps uh, to make public transport more accessible and more affordable um, and we'll continue to, to make that progress in the years ahead as we have to do a range of different things to live up to our own climate change targets. Question number four, Pauline McNeill. To ask the First Minister what assessment the Scottish Government has made of the impact of reduced face-to-face -face advocacy services on vulnerable people such as victims of domestic abuse. First Minister. Well, firstly, I want to commend the work of Frontline Advocacy Services. Uh, they've worked tirelessly to ensure that uh, people, including those experiencing domestic abuse, have been able to access support throughout the pandemic. Uh, we're in regular contact with these services to understand the challenges they face and uh, support them as best we can. Over the past 18 months, we've invested an additional £10 million to allow rapid redesign of services and address backlogs, supporting organisations such as Scottish Women's Aid and Rape Crisis Scotland. In addition, our Delivery, delivering Equally Safe Fund also recently confirmed funding to 112 organisations to help them provide key services and prevent gender-based violence. Um, obviously, when this issue is raised, it's important for all of us uh, to see how utterly abhorrent uh, domestic violence is. It should never be tolerated, and if anyone is in need of help, whether from the police or from a support agency, uh, they should not hesitate to seek it. Pauline McNeill. 
First Minister, I especially welcome the additional funding for the Equally Safe campaign. It, it is clear that the loss of face-to-face -face advice will have the greatest impact on the most vulnerable members of our communities. And Rachel Moon, Senior Solicitor at Govan Law Centre, said recently, for the most vulnerable in our society, those with no literacy, no English, no family or monetary support, and a history of discrimination, need a physical place to see a real person to hand over their eviction documents. And we must remember those people who cannot phone, Zoom or scan documents. So given violence against women is sadly endemic in our society, and domestic abuse is rising alarmingly, as the First Minister has recognised. Seeking help remotely at home can be impractical in a controlling and abusive relationship. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government will do to review funding it gives to law centres and free advice sectors so that vulnerable people and women experiencing domestic violence have safe places to access face-to-face -face legal advice. First Minister. Well, as I said in my initial answer, we will continue to do all that we can to ensure uh, funding for those frontline organisations uh, who provide advocacy services, and there are a range of those. Um, obviously, I, I mentioned some of those, particularly in the field of uh, dealing with gender-based violence, but also uh, law centres. Uh, I know I used to work in a law centre many uh, years ago, provide uh, valuable uh, advice and services. In terms of the issue of face-to-face -face, uh, access, uh, very versus telephone or online access, organisations themselves will often be best placed to make the decisions about the correct balance there. It is really important that where necessary people do have the face-to-face -face option, but I know some organisations over the pandemic have found that the necessity of moving more to digital access has actually allowed them to extend their reach. So it's really important that that balance is the right one. It is challenging uh, in these circumstances, uh, but the commitment uh, to funding as far as we possibly can, uh, I hope, will help these organisations return to normal and provide the essential services that they offer to so many people across the country. Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Advocacy services are an important lifeline to many different groups, including vulnerable older people. However, even before the pandemic, reduced funding to advocacy organisations across Scotland meant they were struggling to meet the demand. Therefore, does the First Minister agree with independent advocacy services that increased funding is necessary to allow these organisations to protect vulnerable individuals' rights? First Minister. Uh, yes, I do. I agree with that strongly. Uh, we don't have unlimited resources. That is just a statement of fact. Uh, but within the resources we have, uh, we are seeking to ensure that frontline organisations supporting and providing help for vulnerable people um, have uh, the funding that they need. That will continue to be uh, challenging. Uh, of course, uh, and I'm not talking here, obviously, specifically about domestic abuse, but the range of circumstances in which people uh, will feel the need uh, to access advocacy support. We also need to do more uh, to, to deal with the root causes of some of that. And it is the case that there will be many people uh, accessing services right now, citizens advice bureaus, for example, uh, who are doing that because of the cuts in their benefits uh, that are happening and the often destitution that that is putting them into. Now, we all have a responsibility uh, to support frontline services, but we all have a, equally have a responsibility to try to deal with some of the root causes uh, that lead people to need those services. And I hope that is something the member uh, will also reflect on on behalf of his colleagues. Question number five, Stuart McMillan. Thank you, President. I also to ask the First Minister what consideration the Scottish Government has given to increasing the minimum unit price for alcohol. First Minister. We are absolutely committed to ensuring that uh, going forward we have in place a level of minimum unit price uh, that remains effective in reducing alcohol alcohol harms. Uh, obviously, when minimum unit pricing was first introduced, uh, at that point we did not uh, know that we were facing a pandemic and that has had an impact uh, on uh, use of uh, and consumption of alcohol. Prior to the pandemic, however, we were seeing early and very encouraging signs of a reduction in alcohol sales and a reduction in alcohol-specific deaths. Uh, the evaluation of minimum unit pricing is, of course, ongoing with a final report uh, from Public Health Scotland uh, expected in 2023. And, of course, any change uh, to the level or any detail of the minimum, minimum unit pricing policy uh, must have a robust evidence space. Stuart McMillan. Uh, thank you. First of all, I'd like to remind the Chamber I'm a member of Moving On Inverclyde, a local addiction service. The First Minister will know that the most recent stats indicated that Inverclyde had the highest level of alcohol-related deaths during the peak 
of the COVID pandemic. And every death is a tragedy, and I offer my condolences to those affected. It's clear that minimum unit pricing was having a positive effect, uh, but due to inflation, the effectiveness of the 50p unit price will have declined. And bearing in mind that alcohol was 64% more affordable in 2017 than it was in 1980, particularly in supermarkets and also off sales, would the First Minister consider increasing the minimum unit price in line with inflation, or even slightly above that, in the upcoming budget, and commit to setting up an external commission to look at when future increases should occur and also what level they should be? First Minister. Um, I will certainly consider uh, any suggestions of that nature and, and will take uh, these suggestions uh, into account. Um, it is really important that we do two things. They are obviously related. Firstly, properly and robustly evaluate the policy of minimum unit pricing. Indeed, that was a commitment that was given uh, when the legislation was passed and uh, when the policy was introduced. That is underway um, and we will know the outcomes of the Public Health Scotland evaluation in 2023. But in terms of the level of the price, yes, it is important that we keep that under review and that we take account of factors like inflation, uh, because the level of the price is critical to ensuring that that policy continues to be effective. Uh, there were encouraging signs pre-pandemic that it was being effective. We need to take account of changes since then. So these will be uh, issues of ongoing and very careful and evidence-based considerations uh, of the government. Willie Rennie. Uh, Stuart McMillan is right about this. It's been a, a decade since the 50p rate it was first set. We've got inflation rising quite dramatically, and we've got the sunset clause coming in very soon. I think the First Minister and I agree on minimum unit pricing, but I'm concerned about the lack of urgency in our answer today. I think we need to move faster on increasing the rate. 28 organisations have spoken out today saying the rate should be 65 pence. Will she back the science? First Minister. Look, I, I hope Willie Rennie and others uh, will accept uh, that there are... Uh, probably few people in this chamber more committed to the policy of minimum unit pricing than I am. I was the minister who took the legislation through and uh, obviously we then had a, a very lengthy uh, court challenge uh, and have been committed to that policy uh, right throughout that, including at times when uh, very few people were prepared uh, to predict that it had any chance of ever becoming operational. So I take these points extremely seriously. Uh, we need to consider uh, all of this carefully and we are, and I don't want to, to sound in any way complacent about this, minimum unit pricing will only have the desired effect if it is set at a level that is effective. Uh, there is one other complicating factor right now, and I am saying this as a statement of fact, not for any other reason, and that is the UK Government Internal Market Act, uh, where any changes in the price level, whether by inflation or any other level, could potentially engage the Internal Market Act. That is uh, a source of great concern for us and one of the many reasons uh, why we raised such profound concerns while that Act was going through. So I hope as we take forward this work, uh, members will engage uh, rightly and properly uh, on the detail of, of where a price should be set. That has to be evidence-driven. But I hope we will have the support of members across the Chamber if we do find that the Internal Market Act is a serious obstacle uh, to ensuring that minimum union pricing uh, remains effective, because that would be deeply regrettable, uh, given the history of uh, where that policy has been and how difficult it was to get it into operation. Julian Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Scotland sadly saw alcohol-related deaths rise by 17% in 2020 to 1,190. These devastating figures emphasise that action must be taken and that a range of measures should be implemented to tackle harmful alcohol consumption, including minimum unit pricing. I know the Government plans to consult on the marketing of alcohol, but will the First Minister consider implementing other measures, such as mandating nutrition and health information on alcohol labels and placing a social responsibility level on alcohol retailers? First Minister. Without uh, commenting uh, particularly on the specifics that Gillian Mackay has raised, although they are both important uh, suggestions, uh, let me say in general that we remain open-minded to all and uh, every action that can help us deal with the harm that alcohol misuse does. In fact, when we first uh, proposed uh, minimum unit pricing, uh, it was at that time one of, I think, about 40 different actions that were put forward in our alcohol strategy. Uh, minimum unit pricing is really important, but it is not uh, the only uh, initiative that needs to be taken. So we will consider uh, other initiatives uh, and we will very, very carefully consider the evidence base of those. And that includes, uh, within the powers we have, that includes the suggestions that Gillian Mackay has put forward. Question number six, Mark Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. I draw members' attention to my register of interest as an owner of a rented property in North Lanarkshire. 
and to ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government is taking to support tenants in light of University of Glasgow research indicating that around a quarter of private tenants are in arrears, totalling around £126 million. First Minister. Well, we're very aware that rising rent costs uh, do cause hardship for tenants, um, and while that has been the case for many years, the pandemic has also further exacerbated the financial situation for many, and that indeed is why the government has taken very significant action already. Uh, for example, we have supported uh, and are supporting tenants through a variety of schemes with an additional £39 million. That includes a £10 million tenant grant fund, an increase in discretionary housing payments and a £10 million tenant hardship loan fund. Uh, this year, we have committed £82 million in discretionary housing payments. Um, in the longer term, uh, we have, of course, committed to tackling high rents by implementing an effective national system of rent controls uh, by the end of 2025, and also to introducing a new deal for tenants so that there is quality, affordability and fairness at the heart of the rented sector. Mark Griffin. I'm grateful for the First Minister's answer, um, but with social sector arrears grown by £9 million just between July and September this year, it's clear that arrears are set to dwarf that £10 million grant fund. And to my surprise and the surprise of those in the sector, that isn't even new money, but has been raided from the endless in the End in Homelessness Together fund. And the, the loan fund also appears to be completely useless. It offers tenants in arrears more debt. Most applicants are simply refused. And in the first four months of this financial year, just £42,000 was paid out anyway. So tenants fear a tidal wave of evictions and homelessness. And yet last week's report says landlords want notice periods for arrears to be slashed to the pre-pandemic pre level of 28 days. Can the, the First Minister assure tenants that their rights on notice periods will not be slashed and commit to rent controls in next year's housing bill, not by 2025, as su suggested in our previous answer? First Minister. Well, I think uh, the member can take from my previous answer and from the overall commitments of the government uh, that our objective is to strengthen the rights of tenants, not weaken uh, in any way the rights of tenants. I take his points about financial assistance, uh, although I would say that uh, helping tenants with rent arrears is an important part of helping to prevent and therefore end homelessness. So uh, I think that point uh, needs to be made. Uh, of course, uh, we will look in the course of our budget process uh, at what more we can do to help not, not just tenants, but others who are dealing with uh, difficult financial uh, circumstances right now. If the member wants to make proposals about how we uh, free up more money in the budget, I know the Housing Minister would be perfectly happy to have that conversation. Conversation. Equally, uh, we are happy to engage about the timing of legislation around rent controls. This Parliament rightly uh, wants proper time around consultation and scrutiny of legislation, uh, but we are open to discussions about the legislative programme and how quickly we can move uh, to introduce reforms uh, that will be contentious. I do not believe they will be unanimously supported within this, party, uh, th this Parliament. I hope they will be within this party. I am not sure they will be within uh, this Parliament, uh, but perhaps those who might oppose them uh, are, are murmuring murmuring from sedentary positions uh, just now. But in, to be serious about this, this is a, a real issue. Um, but overall, inflationary pressures uh, from energy costs, uh, from, from rent, from rising food prices um, are going to be significant challenges for many across the country. And this government will do everything we can within our resources to help people deal with those pressures. Thank you. That concludes First Minister's questions. We will move on to members' business. And can members leaving the chamber please do so quietly? Thank you.